Hello, everyone. Welcome to the World Series of Board Gaming's Designer Series. My name is Chris George. And I'm Brian Muller. Or as our stage names, Chris Lancashire. And Birmingham Brian. <laughs> um, yes, we are going to continue this bit for every single designer series. And I'm sorry, but at least you'll get to listen to a prolific designer. Our designer this week is Martin Wallace. Uh, I'm very excited to talk to him, pick his brain about his design process, and just chat about the industry. Hey, Brian. Yeah, it's exciting. Martin Wallace is one of the greats. You know, he's got the, he's got two games in the top 20 in, yeah. on BGG, and he is amazing. And he is just a ton and ton of games. And it's I'm just so excited to, to talk to him and pick his brain about all kinds of things. Yeah, so let's stop us talking and get, head on over to Martin and uh, be sure to stick around at the end because we've got a nice giveaway, as always, with this designer series. Just a quick note, we do have a couple of internet issues in this call, but for the most part, it was a great connection from Canada to the US to Australia. We had a great conversation, so here we go. And here we are. We have Martin Wallace joining us. Martin, thank you so much for jumping on board and, and jumping onto the show. How are you doing this morning? I'm, I'm fine. I'm good. It, it's hot. I'm sweaty. <laughs> it's humid, but otherwise life is good. Yeah, that's, that's fantastic. <laughs> We're at opposite ends of the globe. You're in you're in Queensland, mm. Australia, right? Yes, yes, that's correct. Yeah, I sometimes wish I was there with the snowstorm that's currently outside my windows right now. Yeah, we haven't. I haven't seen snow in the longest time because we get zero snow here. Right, I mean, we just don't. And you you might occasionally get a slight frost, but. No, we don't do snow over here. You have to go down to um, Melbourne around there to see snow go up in the mountains around there. But right. uh, yeah, it, it's warm at the moment. <laughs> um, well, uh, I would love, and I think all of our viewers would love, uh, I, I'm thrilled to have you on. You, I, I feel you're one of the most prolific designers out there. You've got uh, the top, number two game on Board Game Geek right now, which happens to be the game that is in the World Series of Board Gaming. Uh, and, and for those of you watching, stick around because you might have a chance to win that game at the end of the episode, but we won't talk about that now. Uh, I, I'd love to just get a little bit of an insight about your design process, um, what you feel like going into the game, and even how you started in this sort of designing a board gaming world. Like, how did, how did you get your start uh, designing a game? What made you want to design a board game to start out? Uh, that's a very good question. Um, I don't really know the answer to that. It's one of those weird <laughs> things. Um, I played games when I was a kid. Uh, I got into war games when I was you know, 13 or 14. So I played board war games, figure games. Um, I worked at Games Workshop for a while. So I got to know a lot of, this is back okay. in the day before it did Warhammer. Cool. So they, they did a lot of games there. Um, and I drifted away from gaming in my mid twenties. I can't think of any trigger moment. It's just, I don't know. Uh, I think, you know, um, I mean, maybe I was under this false impression that there might be money in designing games, but that, <laughs> that, that has been just proved to me repeatedly. Um, and then, yeah, I, I, I tried various designs and eventually I got something that worked to, to the point that, that people would want to play it again, uh, which was Lords of Creation, which I did in 1993. That's 30 years ago. That's scary. That is scary. Yeah, wow. that is thirty years ago. It yeah, is. it is. I was looking on your on your BGG profile and your list of your abridged list of fifty nine yeah. <laughs> games versus yeah. the one thirty nine that if you if you click mm. through. Um, mm. Well, I I've never played Lords of Creation. What what? Uh, how, how, why do you think you found uh, success with that one versus versus any other? Oh, I wouldn't say I I, I found success. I mean, <laughs> it was a pretty basic kind of risk clone. Um, I mean, I, I think if you played it now, it would show its age. It, re it really, you know, it, it had a couple of interesting ideas in it, but I, I don't think it's a game people would want to play now, I suppose, because it, as I say, it was a game that was influenced my, my war gaming background. Um, right. the, the, um, so basically you, you built a world randomly, you randomly set up a world using that 
on a on a hex grid and you've got different types of terrain and you've got a hand of cards which match those terrain and numbers and that determines where you can put your pieces down uh, i suppose the the, the twist was you, your counters are start as barbarians so one side is barbarian the other is civilized and at some point in the game people start civilizing um and that, that was the kind of twist in the game that civilization spread by adjacency so you could just once per turn i think yeah you could civilize a hex and it didn't have to be your own so sometimes the best oh, cool. way of dealing with somebody who's threatening your borders was to civilize them and then they wouldn't attack you right um <laughs> and then yeah, that that was uh, so. Yeah, it was fun at the time, and I mean, we, uh, I mean, we. I got it printed. Well, this is when I was living in Stockport many years ago. Got a got it printed at a local printers. Took it over to Essen, um, and well, we sold out, but only because we didn't know until we got there that about. Uh, seventy percent of the stock games would be misprinted, which was annoying. Oh, but we sold what we had, so that was good. Um, so, but uh, have you been to Essen? Have uh, you been to Spiel? I've never been to Essen. No, it's on my list. Okay. Right? Yeah. Um, it's always so it's always felt the... pretty far, just being in Canada. I there's mm -hmm. like hitting up Gen Con and like Origins and yeah. all that sort of stuff feels a bit a bit more attainable. Mm -hmm. You should you should try going there from Australia. That that's far. <laughs> um, but the thing about Spiel, or, I mean, I refer to as Essen because that, that's where right. it is. Is yeah. it wasn't so much selling out or making any money because we didn't make any money, and mm -hmm. the game didn't create many webs. But it did allow me to make contacts because when you go there, we went there the following year, and we I mean I've been every year. The only years I've not been. Um, was the one year when it wasn't held due to COVID and the following year. So that would be in 2020 and 2021, right. I couldn't go because the Australian borders were still closed. Right. So, um, but it's making contact. So it's like at that very first essence, and there's a gentleman that came up, bought a copy of the game, following year came back, said, uh, oh um, yeah, I've got a job working for Goldseeber. Um, so if you've got any games, um you know you can submit them and they actually published my first german game which was on chus uh this gentleman then got various jobs at other companies and he's now chief editor at cosmos so oh, wow. you know so that means you know every uh this is wolfgang Lutke. so every s when i go saturday lunchtime we just go for dinner right you know don't necessarily have very anything nice. to show them. It's like, sorry, Wolfgang, got nothing new. Yeah, <laughs> fine, we'll just go for dinner, which is very unusual. As normally, the only reason you have for meeting somebody is because you want to show them something. So, um, yeah. Um, so, yeah, that was a critical part in launching my career, I suppose. Um, that's that's really so interesting because we we've we've been doing we're we're trying to start this designer series on on, on the channel and so we the, our first one was with um Helga Ostertag who was part yep. of the design team for for Gaia project and he also mentioned uh, I asked a similar question he mentioned that yeah it was going to Essen and creating those contacts um do you do you find that there is a large community of of designer and publisher relations and and how would one sort of break into that for any budding designers who happen to be watching right conventions seem to be the the way to go judging mm. by th these couple conversations that we've had uh it's a difficult one now right um i i would say that yeah nowadays if you're an aspiring game designer you got your first game design it's really tough yeah um there's no two ways around that because at somewhere like us and these uh, the ver the various editors working for these companies they will have their meeting schedules booked up months in advance you know because there's all the regulars that they have to meet with so it's very difficult. They're all having dinner with you. <laughs> well, <laughs> one of them is. I mean, there are ways. I mean, they do. There is a, a S and they do have an area where um people can display their games and the companies do go by and look so that's one way of doing it um kickstarter uh i think kickstarter is still the best way in right because 
these companies do look at what's on Kickstarter. Um, and if they see something that takes their interest, then they'll contact you and they may do a reprint. Um, and I think that's happened a couple of times. I can't name any examples, but I, I certainly know that Wolfgang does keep an eye on Kickstarter. So it's difficult. I suppose it's difficult now going up to the front door, knocking the front door, say, I've got a game to show you. It's right. kind of finding a back way in. Um, I mean, and it's like over here, I do meet with designers, uh, again, aspiring designers at different conventions. You know, uh, hasn't happened for a while, but um, because things, you know, due to COVID, yeah. things. Have been yeah, yeah, totally. But if I, you know, if I see something that I think has got potential, and I say, well, look, I can show this to such and such a person. And it's a lot easier for me to do that than it is for somebody else. So, um, so, but it's difficult, but yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, and also, it's like I saw some, you know, the, uh, I was at a convention last weekend and there's some guys there had a new game that they'd been spending uh, years on designing and it all looked very nice. All the artwork was done and it was pretty complicated fantasy theme. And they were asking my advice because, um, and they wanted to go on Kickstarter in April. And my advice was don't just, you know, you, you will die. You know, it's, yeah. it's a tough market Kickstarter now. Um, so my advice, there are two pieces of advice. First of all, you never go with your best game to Kickstarter. You, you, you go with your second best game and then mm. you build up Kickstarter confidence. Right. And then the other thing is, so well, look, let, let's just get, cause it's right at the end of the show. Didn't have much time. Let's follow up the discussion because there are certain companies out there who might be interested in saying well look, can we apply a theme to this so uh in, on ip um so again and i suppose that comes down to who you know in that they didn't know they were going to meet me until right, they saw right. me at the convention and then i could give them advice so in that case that that sense if you are an aspiring game designer yeah you just have to put yourself out there because you never know who you might meet you know, go to different yeah. shows, go to conventions, you know, like, like, like BGG Con. There's a lot of designers that go to BGG Con. Um, they, and they, there's a tabletop network that they run, which I went to in 2019. And that that's very good at trying to assist uh, newbie game designers by giving them a mentor. Um, so there are, there, yeah, there's way more resources sense is a lot more support yeah. now than there was when i started so but there's also a lot more competition so, right yeah. yeah it's it's that give and take of there, there's a large community of people to, to to build you up but there's also a lot of people mm -hmm. who are who are, who are trying trying to grab in um you, you yes. mentioned you mentioned about re-theming this is a, this is a question i've been interested in because i've i've got a couple of designer friends who have just had their first designs picked up by by various publishers but uh, the publishers have wanted to retheme both of their designs specifically to something that they think would be more marketable. Um, do you have mm. uh, much experience with games that you designed that the publisher said, no, we we love the game, but we want to go a different way uh, in terms of theme? Uh, it, it's happened. Oh, trying to remember how many times it's happened it definitely happened with one of my first big games which is uh device of lotus um mm. which got given a chinese theme but the original game was based in sicily yes yeah, so the, the 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 original theme was uh medieval sicily uh mm. and uh with um dealing with the norman conquests of sicily okay. and uh southern italy and then it got rethemed to China. Um, so there you go. I'm trying to think of, but but a same know, sort of conquest a, style, right? Like that was just. Um, it was. It was. It's quite an abstract game, so mm. it it wasn't heavily rooted in history. So I can sort of see how that could be rethemed. Right. Um, a lot of my other stuff is harder to retheme because usually it's closely based on a piece of history right um and it's difficult to disentangle that from that period of history and then retheme it um but not impossible i mean sometimes i do it um it's like for instance i'm just working on a game at the moment called animal rules football 
I don't, you've probably never heard of Australian rules football, but there's the, we have over yes. here we have Australian rules football. So I thought, wouldn't it be? I thought it might be fun <laughs> to do an animal rules football game, which is just That's going to be a great. silly sports game. So the yeah, the, the, yeah. the first the first the first set is going to be kangaroos versus cockatoos, <laughs> and then we're going to have a team of wombats and possums and oh, yes. stuff like that. I love wombats. And, and the actual game itself is a reskin of a game that I've done twice before. The original was uh, Field of Glory, which was a two-player card nice. game. And then we did a new version of that called Militar that came out from the Plastic Soldier Company uh, a number of years ago. And that's the base system. So I've cool. taken what was a war game and turned it into a sports game. Because actually, sports nice. is sort of a war and game. And animals. Yeah. And animals. Take a roll animals. <laughs> yeah, well... And, and, um, so, uh, I mean, there's a few little twists. I've made it more of a deck builder. But basically, yeah, I just wanted to be a silly, light deck builder where you just get cute, right. cuddly animals to on your team. Well, some of them aren't cute. I decided not to do the spider team. I was working on what are the main <laughs> animal types out there. No, nobody will want to play with a team of spiders. That's just too yeah, <laughs> geeky. I don't know. That's... But, that's... Um, Feels like it'd, it'd be pretty fun. You'd you'd run the other way if you were facing yes, off against yeah, the you spiders. Yeah, yeah. But you see, we, I kind of figured because you start in Australia, because each of the decks will be eight will be unique, so cool. it's an asymmetrical thing. And I kind of figure when I get to cat, the cat, the cat expansion will go because everybody loves cats. Yeah, you know, you got all these games of cats, and I thought that should just go through the roof. Yeah, um, <laughs> we have cats versus dogs, um, but we'll see. For sure, that's that's, that's cool. And, and you yeah. and you mentioned like uh, in terms of like deck builder, uh, mm. what I what I'm blown away with is is how many interesting mechanics I feel you've used in the the breadth of your catalog. You've you found a way in brass mm. to make loans interesting and important <laughs> in a game and not punishing. In fact, yes. they're they're a viable option. And and I thought before I played brass, I was like, no way anyone's ever gonna make loans in a way that I'm interested in mm. them. And then I played brass, I was like, oh my goodness. It was almost like the day after I made that statement. I played brass for the first time and I was like, oh well I'm immediately proven yep. wrong. Um yep. are are there any are there any mechanics that you're you're particularly uh, drawn to uh, specifically? Or you're thinking, yeah, I really like working in this realm, or things you want to currently expand to or or, or experiment with. Um, yeah, I mean, I I did I did do quite a few games of deck building, and for a while I th I, I if anything is reversed, I was thinking. I'm using deck building too much because it's so easy to do. Right. It's such a powerful mechanism. And but the problem is sometimes it doesn't always apply because sometimes no matter what the theme is, you're kind of playing a deck builder. Right. So sometimes I think I, you know, I'm deliberately not going to use this set of mechanisms. Um otherwise, um so I don't really think in those terms. I don't really think in terms of mechanisms as such. Um, You're more theme first, basing it off of yeah. that. Is how, how do you get the feeling of this mm. historical yes. setting and then implementing yes. that in a in an interesting Absolutely. way? Cool. Um, it's like, yeah, so um, I think I'm working. I can't, I can't really say what the theme is because um, the company, there's a particular company asked me to do a game with a particular theme. But I haven't even started the design process. So I'm just at the research stage. Right. And so I'm just reading. I'm just reading on this particular theme. I'm reading lots and lots of books. And I've got no idea what the mechanics will be. Um, I suppose one of, it's not so much a mechanic, but I, I suppose one of the games that I've been influenced by recently has been Terraforming Mars. Uh, okay. And again, it's not because of the mechanics, because mechanically it's quite simple. Right. But I do appreciate the amount of stuff in the game. You know, the yeah. fact that each card is unique and it all feels thematic. Um, and I, I love that idea. So there is there is a game I did when I was in COVID lockdown. I kind of decided to indulge myself because I wanted to do uh, a civilization game, you know, a big, yeah. juicy civilization game, just chock full of different um, people's events, artifacts, and so on, all, you know, all, um, just cramming the history in. 
Uh, and right. I, so I'd probably say that that was influenced by terraforming Mars, even though I didn't use the same mechanics. Actually, I mean, actually, with that, I used the mechanics from Anno 1800. Cool. Okay. So that, that if yeah, if anything, it's just like that wanting to get, you know, if there is a history thing, you know, how much of this history can you get in? That, that That's the thing that interests me and uh, I suppose excites me. Right. Um, yeah. So you, you've done a lot of uh, transportation based games as well, too. And mm. uh, ships and uh, uh, plenty of railroad games. Um, and yeah. a lot of those end up being very math math oriented but when in the process do you start getting getting very mathy into to your game design um you see i when you say mathy it, yes i know there's numbers and there's ratios involved but i very rarely actually sit down and work out the numbers it, it all happens in your head it's just a a general feeling about cool. what numbers will work uh so it's a little bit like cooking when yeah, that's probably at the right level of salt. Um, <laughs> but you, you, I don't, I mean, I don't know how Reiner Knizia works, but he, his background is maths and may, maybe he does apply um, a more mathematical approach to some of his games. But I very rarely do that. It's just, I go with the feel. Um, wow, that's that's impressive. Well, it's, it's just, it's, it's like going back to the civilization games. I, right. I, I compiled big list of all of the things I wanted in the game because it's card based I could do it I said right okay I've got this set of cards these are the things I want and put them on a card and said right now each of the cards has to have an effect and there's a this is a restricted it wasn't like an infinite number of effects but the thing is I go through each card saying right given this card what effect should it have and that's what I did I just went through right. the cards and at no point did I think Oh, I've got too many, and, and you know, some of the effects are repeated because you, 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 there's only so many things. The, the game only allowed for so many different types of actions. Um, but at no point did I think, oh, what should the balance of say attack cards be to resource cards? It was just these are the cards I wanted to do. These are the things you know. These are the things that logically go on the card. Yeah, and that ended up being the ratio, and somehow it worked. But there, there was no. There's no conscious no spread decision. Hmm? No spreadsheet yeah, that you had to punch through. No, or... no, no, no. Um, it just all came together. And it's weird. I've done that a number of times where I don't worry, you know, too much about balancing cards. You know, I mean, sometimes it happens during development, but right. um, sometimes things just come together. Uh, so, I mean, I had that. I did um, going back to rethemes. Um, and this is sort of public knowledge. Um, I've done a game for um, Stone Sword Games, who did a game called Senjutsu on Kickstarter last year or the year right, before last. Right, yeah. And they asked me to do a Japanese shogunate period game, uh, Daimyo. Mm. Um, and basically, I rethemed Struggle of Empires, which you may or may not know, but that's one of my older games. And, and it fitted perfectly. Everything slotted in. All of the history fitted in, and it's like, whoa! It was just incredible. You know, exactly the right number of provinces for the game, right? Uh, a good range of characters for the game, and even. I mean, I don't know how much you know about uh, Shogunate here. This is like this is um, that 1570s to 1600, um, and even had three wars. And in the struggle of empires, I arbitrarily decided there were going to be three wars because <laughs> they were just just because I picked three. But here, there actually were three wars. It, it, it's amazing. It just sometimes, yeah, the history just fits in. Uh -huh. um, but uh, yeah, I forgot what the original question was now. Oh, I think um, it's a it's a free. Oh yes, doing the maths thing. Yeah, the yeah. transport. <laughs> yes, doing the maths thing. Yeah. Now I don't do maths. I'm terrible at maths. <laughs> Um, what well, Daimyo that has is that going to be Kickstarter? Because I know yes. I know Senjutsu was was Kickstarter, so that'll be coming yes, out later yeah, in, be, later in the year. It'll, it'll be sometime. It might be the first half of this year. Cool. We'll see. You know, what it's like with Kickstarters, right? They, 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 yeah, they, they, yeah. They, um, you, you know, they can extend and yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, but yeah, um, but yeah, that 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 
yeah, just sometimes things just all come together. But anyway, next question. Mm. Well, uh, that that brings up an interesting uh, thought about the design process. Is um, mm. how how on average? I mean, you've done you've done so many, and, and it, I was looking on BGG again. The the notable things there were like six or seven released in 2018. I'm wondering how mm. long uh, you have a night before you have an idea. How long does the play testing uh, stage go for? What's a typical design map? for you and and your your games um generally now it's pretty quick because yeah. i've because i've done this so many times before i can go i go i can go from idea to prototype in a couple of weeks depends depends what research needs to be done right. so it's like the animal rules football that took me a couple of weeks to put together because i'd already there was no research involved um mm -hmm. So some things come together very quickly. Um, other things, like a yeah, few acres it, of snow, it, it, a few acres, a few acres of snow came to get that came together fairly quickly, um, because the deck building worked right. Um, it kind of worked first time, so that that came together fairly quickly. I, um, I mean, it's like the uh, anno eighteen hundred. Um, because Wolfgang asked me to do that. I think that was I think that was in June uh twenty eighteen. Okay. Yeah, because we met at the UK Expo. Yeah. And he said, uh, yeah, we, we need this game and we need it ready for next year, uh for October next year. Which means if you have if you have to have a game ready for October October the following that means the game needs to be printed yeah around about March so you've got less than a year to design and develop a complex euro game <laughs> uh, yeah okay fine um and I don't know if you're familiar with Anno 1800 but it's based on a computer game by Ubisoft mm -hmm. and I don't play okay. computer games I just don't play I just don't I, don't, I just don't get them I they're just these big computer games I just get bored after five minutes so I actually paid a friend of mine to play it. I paid him a thousand dollars. That was good money. That was good money. So here's a thousand dollars. Go play that game to death, and then tell me about it afterwards. Which he did, and he he broke it down, and he said, "Yeah, these are the core elements of the game." And once once I got my head around the the weird thing with Anno is, and it's what I would, it's it's kind of interesting sometimes. You put in a position where you have to do something you don't want to do. Because mm. normally when I'm designing a game, one of the things I feel is you don't want too many resources, you know, right. maximum of three different types of resources. You don't want to overwhelm people with different types of resources. So generally I don't have a range of an unnecessary wide range of resource resources where Anno is just all resources. Mm. I mean, it's just, that's all the game is. It's just, there are hundreds and hundreds of resources <laughs> and it's all about, yeah, to get this resource, you need that resource. And to get that resource, you need that resource. It's just a massive, massive resource chain. I thought there is no way I can get all of these resources into this game, and which is absolutely true. Because you know, you, you, I couldn't do. But I did the idea of having them represented. Because normally resources are represented by tokens. You know, you have little gold tokens, you have mm -hmm. wood tokens. You know, and can you imagine having tokens for thirty or forty different resources? I thought that that'd just be crazy. That, that there's no way you could do that but then i turned it around and said well maybe you don't show don't maybe you don't have the resources represented that way maybe you get the resource maybe you have a building for that resource and you get the resource when you put a worker on it so then it's just at the point where you need it you put a worker on the building you get that resource so therefore it's in a sense it's the worker that represents the, the resource now right. but the worker can go to different buildings um, and so I did actually manage, uh, I think, yeah, so I started working on June by October, because I saw Wolfgang again in October. By then, the game was 90% done. I mean, I, I pretty much made wow. a, a workable <laughs> prototype. Wow. I mean, it worked first time we played it. The first time we played the game, the game worked. We got all the way through the game. And it, yes, it needed polishing. There was a few, obviously, you don't get everything right first right. time. Yeah. But the first time we played it, we could play it all the way through and finish the game. That doesn't happen very often. Normally, as you know, if you've ever done playtesting, yeah, 
you get about a third of the way through and go, yeah, there's some nice ideas here, but this isn't working. And you go away and you refine them and so on. But no, that, that worked pretty much first time. So I do work quickly. I can, you know, I, when, when, it, when the idea is there, it's like, boom. Um, so I can probably turn, yeah, I can turn game design around. I mean, I don't know what speed other designers work at. Um, but yeah, I'm pretty quick. What what would have been uh, the longest you've ever you've ever needed to spend to to get that game right, or or is there a point uh, where you uh, just you you scrap it and you move on to something else because you're like, nah, it's not clicking. Um, maybe I'll come back to it later. Yeah, I I don't know. Um, I mean, the, so it's the develop the the design process is the quickest part in a sense. The development mm. process can go for a long time. So it's like that Civilization game right. I was talking to you know. The original game came together very quickly because it was based on another game, but it did go through a long development period just to get things exactly right because it's a big yeah. economy. And then it was a similar thing with, with brass. There was a lot of testing and it had to go into brass just to get the economy right because you've got different inputs and different outputs. And if they're not in balance, mm -hmm. the whole thing can fall apart. Um, and it's a trial and error process. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think it was the longest game. Just looking. I don't really remember. Um, there's plenty of games I've scrapped. Definitely. And, um, some, yeah, there, there, there's some games that get scrapped because they're not working. Right. Uh, there's some games that um, you can't do because you can't get the license. Um, it's like I... The, this is not answering your question, but going. No, back, no, this is yeah. Um, it's like uh, back when I was in New Zealand, I start I, I um, licensed a game to Osprey, uh, okay. um, who you may have, may have heard of. Yeah. Uh, so Osprey, they're a book publisher. Do do um, mostly military history books, but they they've gone into board games and they contacted me because they wanted to do uh, a new version of London. Like, okay, fine. And Osprey are part of Bloomsbury, uh, which you may or may not have heard of, a, a UK um, publishing house, mm. who also happened to publish um, Harry Potter. Okay. Oh, so yeah. there's me thinking, oh, oh, so um, I could do a Harry Potter game. Yeah. So I did. I, I read all of the books in... I basically read, did all of the reading and all of the design in three months. Wow. Yeah. And it's all of the books in one game. And, it, you know, although I say it myself, the game is awesome. It's just, <laughs> when we were playtesting it, just some of the best gaming moments ever. Because it's all about not, it's a secret identity thing. You know, are you all cool. of the Phoenix or are right. you one of the Death Eaters? And right. You kind of, so it's like it's a little bit like a um, study in Emerald, where you've kind of got that team play, but you don't know who's on your team, right? Kind of thing. And I thought Bloomsbury had a license. Turns out they don't. Uh, apparently, the license belongs to Warner Brothers. Oh, know? so <laughs> so couldn't get the license. I've got a game there, sat there just gathering dust. It all works, but there's no way of publishing it. And then you add into that. Now the uh, con um, that J.K. Rowling has become a rather controversial figure because yeah. of her views on trans rights. And trans yeah. rights, and you're now thinking, is that somewhere I want to go? Right, hundred percent. Because it, yeah. it's suddenly there's all these kind of politics involved. Well, politics, maybe, but yeah. It, so I'm thinking, yeah, you're probably not going to do that one now, right. which is a shame, but. Um, do you think you'd be able yeah. to to retheme it into something, um, or yeah. but because because it's so it's so attached to the to that world, yeah, right? It it, it 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 and yeah, I've had this discussion, my right. friend Cassie. It, it wouldn't work, and I went through a similar thing. I did, I did the third Discworld game, The Gods, and I got that to the point it was working, and then we lost the license because right. uh, uh, Satori Pratchett passed away. Yeah. And I'm thinking, and there's a company saying, oh, could you retheme it? And it's like, and I tried, and it was really dull. Um, they say my internet connection is unstable, doesn't surprise me being in the middle of nowhere. Um, 
And because it only worked because it had that Discworld humor in it. Right. Where Because the cards were connected to each other in really sh- weird, stupid ways because those characters were connected. If you'd read the books, you go, yeah. oh, yes, I know why that character does that because in the book – yeah, that character did such and such a thing. Whereas, if you, I was using real, you know, not real, real gods, but you know, using standard mythologies, you know, North mythology, Greek mythology, yeah, and so on. But all, all the gods fit a niche. They've all got a god of war. They've all got a god of love. They've all got a god of harvest and so on. And they all do the same thing pretty much. So, no, it some some games just can't be rethemed. Right. But you know, there you go. Uh, I get enough. It's not like I can complain too much. I get, I get enough games published. It doesn't matter if a few don't get published. Well, well. Speaking of, speaking of re re updates, mm. um, mm. what made Brass Lanc, which is now Brass Lancashire, mm. w- how did that make the jump to Brass Birmingham? Uh, and and what was that Ooh. sort of decision making process, or or why did you did you even feel like you you wanted to take another stab at it, uh, or 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 do this sort of separation or, or or whatever it was yeah um i don't know what details to share on this because i don't know who's going to be watching this <laughs> fair well it's just a weird what story you can. <laughs> yeah it's a weird story um so i got brass lancashire mm-hmm. um i i had no idea it was going to do as well as it did and yeah i probably can't go into it but anyway there, there was some there was some murkiness there Fair. Some people will know what I'm talking about. Um, this is really bizarre thing where I I was really struggling for money at the time. Uh, this is when I was in New Zealand, and sometimes the only way I could raise money was by selling IP outright. So hmm. I, I've done this a number of times, and Fantasy Flight were interested in brass, um, and it looked like they were going to take it. And then this other company that thought it, who'd been publishing Brass without my knowledge, who thought they had the rights to it, but didn't, stepped in and blew that deal up. And then, but around about the same time, I'd I'd got an email from this company I'd never heard of, Roxley, Mm -hmm. a Canadian company, um, saying, you know, uh, Gavin from Roxley saying, yeah, it's my number one favorite game. If there's any way I can get this game just please let me know. So the original deal fell through and then um, I said to Gavin, yeah, okay, let's, let's go with this. Um, which I shouldn't have done really. Cause I didn't know this company. You know, they'd only <laughs> done one game before. And I started work. I don't have had them back in my head and I thought, yeah, let, let's um, finish this off. Um, and then they took that and then they did a lot of development work on it. Um, mm. and then they changed the way beer worked and they, they right. added the scout carts and so on. Difficult to remember, remember the details. It's a long time ago. Um, but, um, and I think they changed some of the map locations, but anyway, uh, just those little tweaks, but that, but... Little, little, yeah, sweet, some small tweaks, some bigger tweaks. Um, mm. And then they just did the most stunning artwork and then it went crazy. And, you know, if you said to me, see, when I first did Brass in 2007, that was back in the day, if you did a gamer's game, yeah, you'd be lucky to sell three or 4,000. I mean, that was just the size of the market then. You know, you just, you know, you, your mass market were, were, you know, were your nice, slight, simple family games, but there was no mass market for serious war games it just uh, serious board games you know heavyweight board games it didn't exist so hence why very often i would sell the ip because there was no more value in it because right you were never going to reprint the game you hit all the people yeah you've, you've, yeah you've sold all the copies you're going to sell so so yeah if you said to me oh yeah your best selling game and highest earning game is going to be a game about the industrial revolution in england <laughs> i'd say you're talking crazy there. That, that's silly. That makes no sense to me. Um, but yeah, it seems like even when I say like even when I designed the game, I thought, yeah, it's okay. I didn't, I didn't think it was amazing. I didn't think this will, this was my best game. I just thought, yeah, it's nice. It works. It, it did what I wanted it to do. Uh, 
So it's weird how the market yeah, it's market reacts to things. How, yeah. What, how people react to things. I mean, it's great because I made way more money. Right. From royalties from Roxley than selling the game outright to uh, Fantasy Flight. So, yeah, dodge, dodge the bullet there because, <laughs> yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's still, you know, I might have a lot of games published, but most of them don't make money. So, right. Um, so yeah, you, you need you need to have those games that do bring in decent money, just so you can pay them, you know, pay the bills. Yeah, well, well, that also brings up um, um a, a question I'm interested in. You say brass, you don't think was your best design. Yeah. What are there any that that you feel are your best? What's the best Martin Wallace design out there? <laughs> um, I don't know. It changes from week to week. Of course, so I've got right? a soft i've I've got a soft spot for a study in emerald because. Okay. And it's not a game that always works. It, it it's it's fragile. But when it does work, it's really good. Because yeah. again, it's got this kind of hidden identity thing in it. And you know, the bluff double bluff thing. Um and I suppose I was quite pleased to how I te- could take what is a, a short story and flesh it out with all of these real world characters. So it's a melding of a kind of fantasy literary source with a real world source uh i, I kind of enjoy that and it's, it's something at some point i'd like to return to because i think sometimes with games just having them based in a fa- generic fantasy world people can't connect to that whereas right. if they're real people it's easier to connect with it yeah this person really existed uh, and even though we're changing the history somewhat and putting it putting a fantastical spin on it you can still connect with them as real people um so i think study in emerald i'm very proud of uh I think of what else uh yeah you don't I have think to that have might be my favorite yeah, yeah, it, yeah. It's, um and it's a long time since i played it because it's difficult finding people uh, right who who problem is you have to play it a couple of times to get it and that, that's a problem nowadays people don't mm-hmm. want to play games a couple of times so for sure but no i think i'll go with that yep cool well well hey with our we want to do a giveaway with any with all of these designer series mm. so if they happen person who wins the giveaway happens to own brass birmingham we we chose because it's part of the world series mm. well then then we'll try to get you a copy of uh, study for emerald because uh, okay. it's better it's better than that brass birmingham nonsense <laughs> <laughs> yes yes yeah yeah uh. um yeah, that's 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 awesome. And then so now you've started your own publishing company, right? Martin mm. Wallace Publishing. Uh, how, uh, how... Wallace Designs. Oh, yeah. Wallace Designs. Yeah. Wallace Designs. Yeah. Um, how how did that come about? And and how long has been how long has been how long has that been been a thing and or been in development even before yeah. it, it it kind of launched? I think. Um, uh, yeah, because I was publishing your games before moving to New Zealand. When we moved to New Zealand, we tried to continue publishing Retreat Frog, but it was just too difficult. And right. then just mm-hmm. things fell apart. And then I thought, well, let's just try making making a living just licensing games. Um, but that's too difficult. It's very hit and miss. And you've got no idea what you're going to make off a design. Right. Um, usually nowhere near as much as you thought you would. And so it got to the point, I thought, you know, you know, because we've got a house and because we need a steady income, I thought, yeah, there's really no choice but to go back to publishing. But the thing is, the world has moved on from when I first started. When I first started, you you just put a game out there, people buy it. Um, you didn't really have to do much marketing or anything because there yeah. wasn't a lot of competition. Yeah. Whereas now it's all marketing. And I'm rubbish at that. I, I'm just no good at that. I'm no good at uh, – I don't do Facebook. I don't do Twitter. I don't do all of this uh, – media stuff so i decided so i had a game bloodstones which i mm-hmm. figured had to be done on crowd you know crowdfunding platform but i needed to get a team together and that was the thing that took me some time is finding the right people right and covid didn't help with that for um, sure because I, i'm i was very keen on working with people that i could meet with face to face yeah um, mm-hmm. 
because normally, yeah, if you want an artist, there's thousands of artists out there. You know, you can just go on these various art, you know, galleries. And you can find artists all over the place. But I thought, no, I want people I can work with face to face, so I can sit down with the game, play it with them. Um, and that's what I've managed to do. Um, so I've now got somebody who manages my ca campaigns, Cassie Simpson, who did the campaign for Bloodstones. Cool. And hopefully if things go to plan, because uh, we're going to be doing another Kickstarter, hopefully in May, if things go to plan, then that'll give me enough money to bring her on full time. So that'll be Great. the first time in oh, a while nice. since I've had staff. So... So she's going to be my manager because she's more organized than I am and she's good on computers. Um, but then I've got an artist who does artwork regularly for me, uh, Leith Walton, who lives down in Mwilumba, which is just over the border. So it's not too far away. Cool. And I've just taken on an artist to do the work for the Animal Rules Football, who again is Brisbane. And then, yeah, I've got another artist who's going to be helping with this project that we're doing in May, who also lives in Brisbane, although he's in the UK at the moment. Um, so, uh, and I've got another guy local who uh, does my digital animation. So it's like, yeah, I, I'm networking. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's finding good. people who are local, who have got those skill sets. Um, and because there's a, there's, it's not a massive video game scene, but there are a number of video games companies in Brisbane. And they do this okay. monthly uh, meetup. It's a friend of mine who runs it, Truna, who's a lecturer at Q uh, Queensland University of Technology. Um, and I'll go along there on a Wednesday night and I'll bump into somebody who's got a particular skill set I'm looking for. Uh, like last time I was there, there's somebody who's a 3D modeler. And it's like, well, actually, for one of my projects, I do need some 3D modeling. Um, got his contact details. It's like, yep. Yeah, I'm going to be in contact. So, um, so yeah, it, so yeah, I, basically I am just networking like hell at the moment, just finding out right. who's local. It's got those skill sets. Uh, and, and the reverse of that is, you know, these couple of artists I found were really keen to get into board games and it's difficult to do. Brisbane is very isolated, you know, uh, we're a long way from anywhere. Yeah. And there is no board games industry as such really, over this side of the world um and i think from their point of view it's like great being involved in something that's got lots of possibilities because it's you know it's got my name attached to it i've got my contacts so i can make things happen in a way that somebody new coming into this field couldn't right um oh cat moment speaking um, of speaking of cats versus yeah. uh cats versus dogs <laughs> yeah yeah there we go cats win hands down yeah hey, buddy. uh so, yeah, so it, it and it, it's also one of the reasons why I used to do publishing myself is because then I can print whatever I want. Right. It's like you don't have um, to worry about those re themes, you don't have to worry about nope. publishers wanting to, to tweak things. You can, you can yeah. stay the course, right? Yeah, because it's like there's a game I start, I, I knocked together last year. Didn't take me long because it was just reusing old mechanisms. So I thought, I want to do another train game. Okay. So I've done this train game. It it's, uh, involves track laying. I Basically, I wanted to do a, um, uh, a train game that was all about making connections. So using track laying. Because I kind of figured Age of Steam is a bit too complex for a lot of people. 18xx mm. is way too complicated. Railways of the world is kind of too big. And and all those things, I I have no say in them. They're not they're not things I I uh, can do anymore. I thought I want my own train game. Yeah. So and I want it to be beautiful. So I you know it's 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 an, it's, a, it's simpler than its other ones. It's kind of it's a weird mix of Age of Steam and Brass because you have this thing where yeah you're building track but you're also building factories and you need the factories to fulfill contracts right and you you take the goods from those factories kind of thing plays very quickly i mean we you can play a four player game in under an hour so for a train game it's oh, like wow. really quick wow that's yeah that's pretty yeah. quick yeah uh, but you still got all those interesting decisions of mm -hmm. which places do i connect where do i build my factory or do, do i buy stuff from this player or something right but the thing is 
I, I I don't know if you looked at Bloodstones, but what I did with Bloodstones is you you, you have this fake silk maps. Okay, so you don't have a cardboard okay. map. You have a fake silk map, and you have uh, domino pieces. So there's actually no cardboard in the game. And I wanted, I was thinking, could I do the same for a train game? So rather than having cardboard tiles, what I want to do is I want to do poker chip style tiles. So imagine a poker cool. chip that is a hexagon with track printed on it. And then you've got nicely molded trains and nicely molded factories. So again, no cardboard in the whole game. And now this game is going to cost a fortune to produce. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Like, like I mean, hmm? Great exactly. To kick you can, exactly. Yeah. As long if you can, as long as you can sell direct, it's doable mm -hmm. um, because you don't have to worry about your distributor or shop um, margins. So I can indulge myself and do something which is stupid, but there's no way I could do that <laughs> with another company because there wouldn't be enough money in it. Right. Yeah. So. Yeah, um, I mean, we'll, we'll probably do a cheap as chips version as well for the wider market because, yeah, this is going to be expensive. Right. But hopefully, it's just going to look gorgeous. And it's just going to be, sounds, yeah. Sounds uh, nice. Yeah. No, uh, and it plays really well, plays really smoothly. Um, so, yeah, I, I that's the fun thing. I, I get caught. Cool. I don't have to worry about placing a game with somebody. I can say, yeah, this is what I'm going to do. And we're going to make it happen. Um, I going back to Tree Frog days. I mean, I did a game on the history of Poland, uh, God's Playground. I was told years before, you know, when I was talking about doing such a design, there's a German friend of mine saying, you will never sell that game over here. Uh, he said huh. you know, that it's a complete dud um, theme. Yeah. He said you might sell a few in New York to the Polish community there. And yeah, it wasn't well, I mean it did get reprinted. Yeah, it got reprinted by Phalanx. So but yeah, I was able to put a game out there and some people enjoyed it, you know, and it, it was a game, a detailed game on Polish history, which had never been done before. Right. Um so yeah, it, it's like it's yeah, I, I get to play and have fun doing stuff that nobody else would do. So it's great. That's cool. And you said that was that was May. And now I've got. Sorry. Uh, yeah, we're doing a Kickstarter. There's a project. Uh, um, well, my next Kickstarter. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Sorry, we. we... Yeah, I'm working on. The the the, the yeah, internet being. Yeah, I'm working on a um a game called. It's based on the fighting fantasy books, which mm. again you may or may not have heard of. So it's my. Actually, it's not my first foray, it's, but I, I'm not known for doing fantasy dungeon crawls. That's not normally my thing. But this is a cooperative dungeon crawl using the IP from the fighting fantasy books. Um, but it's a nice and simple one. I, I, I kind of felt um, that there might be a market for a simple kind of light role-playing game because mm. you know because role-playing's come back in a really big way and you've got these oh, yeah. big kind of uh role-playing board games like gloomhaven and, and whatnot mm -hmm. but th this is aimed at just being really light and simple so you can set the thing up simply you know set it up quickly there's a simple set of rules but you still got all of those interesting decisions about yeah. who's going to go in the room first, which box you open, you go left or right here, or, you know, which for me is, is the fun part about role playing. It's not, no, it's not understanding the rules. It, yeah. it, it's playing the situation. So, so that's, that's a really big project, uh, which is why I needed a team because right. it's going to be an ongoing thing. So hopefully it'll go well. If it goes well, then yeah, it'll be a nice ongoing, uh, uh, Nice little learner, but we'll see because it, it's slightly outside of my normal range. So it'll be interesting to see what people make of it. It'll be such a big uh, world so yeah, in which you that. can keep doing more, right? Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, it, it, it's is unlimited because the thing is, the base system could be applied to any um, uh, theme. Cool. So, and again, that's one of the things I want to explore is because I did this a little bit with Age of Steam, and I did. But it was it was unintentional 
un unintentional. But back when we first put Age of Steam out, you could have these people doing their homebrew maps, and which is why right. you've got so many different maps for it. And I kind of think people do want to engage in our, our, our hobby. They just might not have the ability or what it takes to do a fully fledged game, but they can do some of it. And that allows them to engage in a way that for them is fulfilling uh, and creates new content. So that's something I want to do with this is to make, uh, create a system and allow people to play with it and create their own adventures. So, you know, they, cool. so we, you know, we'd make artwork available for them to take so that they can do their own stories. Cause you, you never know what ideas are going to come from out there. You know, you, you know, um, I'm not a story writer. You see, I, you know, I can, I can do the mechanics of game design, but I'm yeah. not somebody who it has a story to tell that, uh, mm -hmm. but there are people out there who might not be game designers, but they have, there's an interesting story that they want to tell. And, and this is a vehicle for telling stories, you know, for creating adventures and weird mm. situations and so on. So, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of interested in yeah, creating structures, creating a structure here in Brisbane that other people can use, plug into to right. help them get into the market. And I, it's not fully fleshed out. It's kind of like fumbling towards it. And, but yeah, that, 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 that is something that interests me it is allowing, opening up a doorway to this hobby for other people right cool that's that that's really cool well i i don't want to take up too 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 much more of your time we've been talking for a little while uh, martin yeah, cool. um but uh just i guess one last question is um mm. other than yourself uh who are your favorite uh game designers and what what are your favorite games that you like to that you like to play uh or or if there's been um, any large influences in your work uh, you've seen people uh, I know you mentioned Terraforming Mars earlier in that mm. specific circumstance, but if there's any any other sort of games or or, or designs that you've enjoyed just I'm, to play or or inspired, yeah, you. I'm I'm very very picky. There's a lot of, there's a lot of new games I play. I go, oh, don't don't really like that, and I think that's partly because as a game designer, you can see yeah. behind the facade, right? Um, so yeah, I am very picky. Games I'm enjoying at the moment, I'm really. I shouldn't do, but I'm really enjoying June Imperium. Um, yeah, there you go. So, nice. Yeah, that, 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 I played that quite a lot recently because it's asymmetrical and it's got the deck building in mm -hmm. and it's relatively quick when you're playing with people that know the game. Yeah. Um, I do enjoy Terra Mystica and Gaia Project. They're, they're, they're some of my top games. So uh, I suppose I like games where you feel there is interaction and you, and you feel that you're responsible for your own success, you know, that you can have a plan and you can have a strategy and follow that. Uh, I like Concordia, Puerto Rico. Um, but those are some of my favorites. Cool. In terms of game design, I mean, it's not so much favorite game design as such, but as game designer, I think has been the most influ influential, I suppose, would be Francis Tresham. Uh, who's passed passed away a few number of years ago now? Um, I suppose that's because he, you know, single handedly kind of invented uh, some of the key genres that we game designers play in. You know, the civilization game and the train game. Cool. Um, and I don't think there's been any designer like him since then. Uh, his designs are. Yeah, they're unlike anything else in the sense they're like clockwork mechanisms, you know, because there's no very, very rarely random elements. And you've got these weird clockwork mechanisms that work due to player interaction. Um, so, yeah, he, I think he'd be my number one game designer. Cool. Really cool. Yeah, I mean, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. I think the, the train genre, which... Uh, you know, there's there's still more to more to see with those yeah, hexagon yeah. Uh, poker yeah. chips. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yep. Awesome. That's really cool. Thank you, Martin, so much for for your time and what what was a really fun conversation um, on my end. And for for those of you watching, uh, stay tuned. Brian and I will tell you all the details of how to enter that giveaway. Uh, but once again, Martin, thank you so much, and uh, hope you have a, a wonderful day. 
That's okay. I'm going to go back to shelf building now. So <laughs> there we go. <laughs> no, no, lovely to talk to you. Lovely to meet you. And uh, maybe one day we'll meet in person. You never know. Maybe I will get over to the... Um, hey, many of your favorites Vegas. are at uh, WSBG, Dune Imperium, yeah. Gaia Project. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I I just get beaten horribly. <laughs> I I don't do game competitions. Uh, I think I'd just be in the free play area. Um, hey, that's that, that's a great that's place to love. be. That's where yeah. I like to be too. Yeah. I think I would yeah. be in the first round. I would enjoy. I would enjoy being the first round, and then I would enjoy playing mm. a whole bunch of other games there too. But, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, that's awesome. great. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thanks. Again, I think I love doing this series, Brian. That was a heck of a lot of fun. This has been a a great series. That he's so interesting. All the things that he talks about, and uh, I can't wait to try out some of those games that he's talking about bringing, especially that uh, Animal Rules football. I've yeah. got to figure out how to <laughs> score a copy of that. Yeah, it's it's uh, it was fascinating to hear. I loved the comparison of board game design to cooking. Like, oh, just try that. Just try a splash. And I guess once you've when you've designed so many games, as many games as he has, you kind of know how the sausage is made and you can feel it out as you're going as any sort of expert in their craft, as Martin Wallace absolutely is. Um, that was great. And our Internet held out pretty well, too, which was lovely. Just a couple blips, but not too bad. Uh, yeah, that, that was a heck of a lot of fun. Yeah, so he had. Oh, he yeah, has yeah. some great nat natural instincts. Mm -hmm. I, I wasn't aware of how keen he was on from an instinct perspective, but he just seems to, to be able to be that prolific and yeah. just to uh, move through design like he does. He, that is some great instincts he has. And I love, yeah, again, I love the community that he's trying trying to build there as well, uh, getting local people, because it makes a difference of working with local people and sitting down, I say to you, as we do this remotely over Zoom. Uh, <laughs> but it does, right? There's With gaming, it's lovely. We all, at least I do, for for that tactile feeling, love that tactile feeling. So it's, and being able to sit down in a room with someone and work things out and describe what you want, it's... Uh, awesome what uh wallace designs is is coming up with and so on that note we've got a giveaway to get to uh make sure to drop a comment in the youtube channel below it has to be on youtube because that's where we'll do the randomizing of the comment picking um and tag a friend if somebody somebody sent you over this way make sure they tag you in this because uh you can be entered to maybe win a certain something maybe a maybe a pass to wsbg all the all the friends that refer you to this cool awesome interview um if you tag somebody in your comment well they'll be entered to win something as well but if we pick you you will win a copy of brass birmingham or a study in emerald we'll have to see if we can i'm not sure as to the imprint status of a study of emerald, emerald right now or, or how available it is but if if you already own brass birmingham you can enter this enter this contest and get yourself martin wallace's top design according to the man himself uh so yeah be sure to drop a comment in the youtube comments below and say what your favorite wallace design is Right. If you've played Brass Birmingham, if you've played any of Martin Wallace's games uh, or which game of his intrigues you the most, um, anything, anything that this conversation might have sparked, uh, all, all comments will be valid. But uh, yeah, drop what your favorite Martin Wallace design is and uh, we'll, we'll pick one of those randomly and one of you will win a game. I think that's it for us, though. Yes. So uh, it looks like it's uh, Chris Lancaster. And Birmingham, Brian. <laughs> We're signing off. Um, thanks, everybody, for watching. And if you'd like to participate in the World Series of Vegas, you think you are the Brass Birmingham champion or perhaps one of our other 16 games, be sure to check out our website at wsbgvegas.com. Win yourself $25,000 playing board games. Be crowned the best all-around board gamer of all time. And uh, maybe we'll see you in Vegas. Thanks for watching. <laughs>